what it meant to two parents, his parents, mom and dad, who sent their boy off to academy, and then off to college to be a pastor. And he goes off to Nam and he's a machine gunner in the Marines. What was going on in their heart? Can you imagine they held, how they felt at nighttime when they laid down their head on the pillow and they thought about their boy somewhere over stationed in Da Nang if he'd ever come home again? And so I can still hear them as a young man. Remember, I'm 11 years younger. I can still hear my folks over there kneeling by their bed as they prayed every night. I can hear them audibly talking about each child, and I hear them actually crying about Paul, shedding tears that, that God would protect Paul and bring him home. Well, Paul did come home. He came home twice from now. And I remember Paul showing up, and every so often we talked to Paul, and it became very clear that Paul wanted nothing to do with Christianity. We talked to Paul, and pretty soon he said, we say, hey, brother, you know, you know, you know, it's about time you kind of figure out what you're going to do with your life long term, and aren't you going to figure out, uh, you, know, that, you know, that Jesus is pretty important in your life? He'd say, listen, I've made my choice in life. You've made your choice in life. I have chosen not to be a Christian. You've chosen to be a Christian. Leave me alone. In fact, he said to us one time, if you keep talking to God, I ain't coming around. So everybody dropped the subject. And so for five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years, we're like the disciples that are in the boat. And we're pulling in the net and we're getting nothing. It's empty. It's empty. It's that kind of situation. You may be in a situation like that with a loved one, or a spouse, a friend, a parent, a child. Every night you're pulling in an empty <coughs> net. Then Paul retires from the military, living in California. One day I'm out there at Christmas time. I'm ministerial secretary for, for the Washington Conference in Seattle. I'm going down for Christmas time, and, 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 and we're coming, coming back from playing a game of golf, and we're riding in the car, and Paul turns to me and he says, and my brother law's in the back seat, he turns to me and he says, Hey, Dave, have you ever thought about what God is like? I said, what? You're the guy that wants to talk about God all your life. What are you talking about? Have you ever thought about what God is like? And I said, well, yeah, you know, he's not dating this girl with Christian Scientist Church, and she's taking me to some meetings, and they're talking about God. Have you ever thought about what God is like? I said, yeah, all you got to do is go to Scripture and read New Testament. That'll tell you a lot about what God is like, Jesus Christ. Oh, okay, I hadn't thought about that. We get on home, you know, and we had meals and great fellowship around Christmas, and then we're getting ready to go, go home. And here's the old Marine says to us before we go, hey guys, aren't we going to pray? What is going on? You know, so yeah, we have prayer and all that, and then everybody goes their separate way. And, and um, you know, uh, working with the Lord for, you know, a number of years, I'm saying to myself, you know, something's going on in Paul's heart. So, April, it's Blue Mountain Academy alumni weekend. It just so happens that all these six brothers and sisters I'm talking about ahead of me have all have gone through Blue Mountain Academy. We've all done four years of Blue Mountain Academy. I'm the youngest of all of them, number seven. It's my 20th anniversary. They invited me to come back and speak. And guess what? My other brothers and sisters, many of them are there for whatever year they're celebrating with their friends and, 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 and you know, alumni of that school and so alums of that school. So we're all there. And my mother can't be there for the little sermon. So I say to my brother, I said, hey, brother, do you mind coming videotaping the sermon for, for, for mom? We're still living. He says, I really wasn't planning to be there. I said, well, do you want to come? He says, all right, I'll videotape it for mom. So he's sitting out there, and I have a chance on Friday evening to talk about the Lord at the end of this sermon. I'm saying, those who want to give their heart to the Lord, we'd like to raise your hand, and Paul doesn't put his hand up. But he's out there videotaping this thing and videotaping this thing, and, 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 and then the next day, he's around the academy visiting with all his friends. He hadn't seen, many of his friends he hadn't seen for, you know, 40 years. And then, the next day, we get in the car, we drive up to north of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, we're going to visit a, a brother who wanted to live a little bit like mom and dad. Mom and dad had eight kids, and here is this brother who's raising eight kids, and he invites us to come. Can you imagine raising eight kids today? I mean, you don't have a big farm, but anyway, he's got this house, he's got all these kids in the house, he invited us to come and stay with him, and he says, sorry guys, you can't stay in the house, but you can stay in a little trailer out by the side of the house, this little travel trailer, and so we all pile in there at nighttime, and here's my Marine brother, 
And uh, when we grew up on the farm, you know, he and my brother Mark always uh, slept in the same bedroom, and Joe and I slept in the other bedroom, like kids on the farm. So I'd say to him, I said, I guess you're sleeping with Mark, and I'll sleep here by myself. He said, no, 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 it doesn't work out that way. I said, what do you mean it work out that way? He says, I can't. I said, Mark's in silkies, and I can't sleep with anybody with silkies on. No way am I going to sleep with Mark. And you're with Mark, and I'm over here by myself. You know, I've been in the Marine for too long. I can't sleep with a guy with silkies on. So anyway, so Mark and I get ready to bed down, and um, very interesting. We're driving up to my brother's home, and, and, and Paul is in the car behind Mark and I driving. And every so often, it was kind of a hot day there in April. I'd see Paul take a towel and wipe his face. And I said to Mark, I said, there must be something wrong with Paul's air conditioning because he keeps wiping his face with a towel. What I didn't know is that Paul had received a little cassette from a cousin. Somebody may have known the name of David Gates. I know that rings a bell with anybody around this uh, sort of David Gates, a uh, missionary pilot. You know, his mom and dad were missionary pilots down in, uh, in uh, Bolivia for many, many years, Lake Titicaca. Richard, well, David, his son, um, anyway, he is a ministry too. But anyway, Richard, Paul had gone to visit our cousin Richard, and um, he, Richard could tell the Holy Spirit. You know, when somebody is, when the Holy Spirit's playing with somebody's heart, you can't help but miss something going on. Something is going on. Something, you know, they're saying things that you start to pick up. Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was, you know, speaking through Paul, and, and Richard was getting ready to, to ask him to accept Jesus. And, and, and Paul could sense that. And he says, I, I left Richard's house and took off and went out and went to the hotel, picked up a six-pack, and drank away my troubles. I didn't want anything to do with Jesus. Well, Richard, the next day, he's out, you know, working around this property, and the Holy Spirit is speaking to him, and he says, you know, I... I the Holy Spirit finally told me, sit down and tape him a cassette. Just sit up. Back in the old days, you know, for young people who cassettes are, you probably know what cassettes are, but there's something used to play in the old tape player. Anyway, I guess cars still have them. He, he, he taped this story. 13 minutes, he taped an appeal to Paul. He said, Paul, Paul changed his name to Rock. Now, you need to realize this brother of mine joined the Marines as a buck private. Went to the Paris Island, did all that stuff. When he retired 20 years later, he was a major. Very unusual. He went to he, he went to all the way to being sergeant. Then he got to warrant officer school, and then he went on to and became uh, an officer. He became a lieutenant. And retired as a major. I mean, he changed his name. He didn't want to be called Paul. He wanted to be called Rock. So he says, Richard says, something, you want to be the man of a man. You know, you're a man's man. You think you're really tough." He said, "You know what, Paul?" He said, your bones should be rotting in a jungle somewhere in Vietnam. You should have died there a long time ago, but your parents and other loved ones prayed that God would send his angel to protect you. And for some reason, God has protected you. And if you really want to be a man's man, why don't you live for Jesus Christ? And as Paul is listening to this on the table portion of his car, it starts getting to his heart. I didn't know all that. That night, we got ready to go to sleep. There in that trailer, Mark and I are sleeping in the double bunk. It really is the dinette seat that ever turns into a, you know, a couch. Same so next to Mark. Paul's across the little travel trailer past the kitchen and the bathroom. He's back in the back bedroom. I say, good night, brother. I can turn the light out. Hey, Dave, before you, read, before you turn the light out, could you read something from Scripture? Really? My brother, if you don't talk about God, then like, but something's going on. So yeah, okay. So what do I read? I turn over to John chapter three. Verily, verily, I say unto you, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. There, verily, verily, I say unto you, unless you're born of the water and born of the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And that's what I think it is. Had a little prayer. Turn it off the light. Now we're going to go to sleep. No, no, no. Paul cries out over there. He says, hey, Dave, how do you get born again? And Mark's laying next to me in his soap. He's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a doctor. Went to Andrews to be a preacher and fill out, realized he liked biology more than he liked theology. He mumps me on it. He just hits me with his arm. Tell him, brother, tell him. I mean, you gotta remember, folks, we've been praying for this brother for 25, 28, 29 years. 
They say, how do you get born again? So I simply said, brother, you give your heart to Jesus Christ and you accept Jesus as your personal Savior. How do you do that? You pray the sinner's prayer. Dave, I haven't prayed or used the Lord's name in the right way for 30 years almost. I said, brother, just repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. I want today to claim you as my Savior. Please take my heart. I am yours. And that night, April 1989, my brother gave his heart back to Jesus Christ. Amen. After nearly 30 years. And we three brothers, we got together that evening in that old trail and we wept like babies. But this young man was new again, reborn, giving his life back to Christ. The next morning we got up on the phone, we called mom and dad. They're still living out in Arizona. Told them what happened, they cried and cried and cried. The next year, Dad would come up to, I bet, no, back up, that was 1990, that, that summer, Dad would come to my home in Seattle and watch Paul take his stand in the watery grave of baptism. And Paul was baptized. Back, renewed again. Listen, every night the net was empty, but when Jesus could get through, the net filled with fish. When Jesus can get through to the loved one, their life will be made new again. Let me tell you the footnote of this story. Praise God for what he did in Paul's life. The footnote of this story is, yeah, in 1990, I baptized him. A few years later, Paul found a beautiful young lady, got married, and then he became a literature evangelist. You know what that, you know what the Lewis says? You go door to door and you, you sell Bible books. He said one day he was walking out of the PX in Bangor, up uh, the Marine, Bangor Navy base up in Washington State. And this little kid was talking to their mom and dad. And all of a sudden he sees little kid start yelling, hey mommy, hey daddy, that, that's the Jesus man, that's the Jesus man. And Paul's walking through his car looking around, somebody's pointing at him and calling him the Jesus man. And then he realizes it was he who was in their home a couple weeks before trying to sell them Bible story books. And he got in his car and he says, I can't believe it. They didn't call me the Jesus man. If anybody ever knew who I was, they wouldn't call me the Jesus man. But he didn't give his heart to the Lord. Transformed. A few years later, a conference president there called Paul me a pastor. That conference president retired. And so when I became the president there at that conference, I had the privilege of laying my hands on my own brother and ordaining the gospel ministry. And folks, it is a miracle. What God, can, what God can do. A few years later, Paul died. He died premature of melanoma cancer. Probably got it from Agent Orange, being in Nam. And he's now resting in the grave in Arlington National Cemetery. I can't wait till I see my brother again. But praise God what he can do with life. What's it take to be a Christian? Number one, you let Jesus really take in charge of your life. And you pray the sinner's prayer. It's a very simple prayer. It's a simple prayer. You whisper in your car driving down the highway, Lord, here am I. I'm yours. I claim you as my Savior. It's that simple. And life can change. Now, I started this story. I want to finish it. What it takes to stay a Christian, but also what it takes to become one. I want to take you back here to the story. I want to stay with the story. I want to finish the story in the context because, remember I started this story out by... By Jesus showed himself in this way, and in this way he showed himself. For a reason, he was revealing himself with a very significant reason. Look, the Bible says, you know, they, they had this food and the fish, I should say. And then when they landed the fish near the edge of the shore, as they're getting close to the edge of the shore, Peter gets in the water. John says, hey, it's the Lord. And Peter is soon standing by the Lord's side. And Jesus says, hey, help the guys get the fish. So they drag the fish to the shore. And Jesus says to them now, come and eat. And eat some breakfast. And the Bible says, look at verse 13. This is John 21. Then they came and took the bread and gave it to them. And likewise the fish. Third time the Bible says Jesus revealed himself. Now the question I want to ask the Lord when I get to the kingdom. Is Lord, the fish you fixed for the disciples there on that morning. The fishing morning when they caught all those fish. Did you fix that? Did you catch that fish and fix it? Or did you did you create it right there? I, mean, I just want to know. Did you set the hook? How did you catch the fish? Where did the fish come from in the store? 
I mean, did, did you create it? Somebody says, well, Dave, either way, he created it. Well, I know that. But as for that morning, how did the fish get on the fire? Anyway, Jesus and the disciples are enjoying this wonderful little breakfast meal together. So 